to California, seen the sights and people there. Hi, I'm Michael. And I'm Grace. And we're California, California Travel, Travel Videos. Videos. As the saying goes, life happens when you're making plans. Oh, agreed. And when you're traveling, there's nothing quite as pleasant as when you come across a beautiful sight or a remarkable location. That is true. And sometimes you might get it all in one unexpected location. Mm, how true. So after leaving Maine, we headed south, going through the Vermont White Mountains, which was beautiful, and luckily stumbled across Norman Rockwell Stomping Grounds. And by the time he was 19, he was already the art editor of Boys Life Magazine. Oh my goodness, at age 19. 19. By the time what a he great was start. He was already doing the covers for the Saturday Evening Post. On our way to Albany, New York. Yes, and surprisingly, as we were passing through the southwest corner, we came across Bennington and saw a super tall obelisk that piqued our curiosity to check it out. And thankfully, we had our Garmin Navigator. By the way, that was such a good investment that you made for well, us. Thank you, darling. You're welcome. Right, we guessed that the obelisk was maybe 300 feet tall, dedicated to the Revolutionary War. And we were pleasantly surprised to discover that this site turned out to be a pivotal, mind you, a pivotal rallying point for the Patriots for their war against the English Redcoats. Yes, it is an incredible story. But first, let's go ahead and check out the Bennington Battle Monument, second only in size to the Washington Monument. Hmm. However, the Bennington was built with far less controversy, but we'll save that story for when we get down to Washington, D.C. Oh, really? We've got to wait? Okay. Yep, I'm going to wait. Looking to the north and going around clockwise from southwestern Vermont, north faces the length of Vermont going up to Canada. New Hampshire is to the east, not far since this portion of the state in Vermont is only about 30 miles across. Massachusetts and New York are to the south and the west, an easy walk in either direction. Somewhat of an easy walk for some of us anyway. Right. Incidentally, after the win at Bennington, the following month, the final decisive battle against the British General Burgoyne was nearby at Saratoga, New York, whose obelisk there stands about half the height of Bennington, about 150 feet high. Let's talk a little bit about the Bennington Monument statistics. Quoted as Vermont's most popular historical site, the Bennington Battle Monument was constructed in 1891, drawing visitors of about 50,000 per year. Be sure to check out their website for their hours of operation and when the elevator is up and running. <laughs> the monument was constructed from magnesium limestone, also known as Sandy Hill Dolomite. It stands just over 300 feet, 306 feet tall to be precise, with the Statue of Liberty one foot less at 305 feet, and the Washington Monument being the tallest of all, 555 feet and five inches and wow, change. that is huge. I know you're wondering why the monument was built. So for this part, take it away, Michael. Okay, here we go. You know, I don't think there's a good way to say this, but all too often, man goes to war. The fact is, in the 1800s, my German and French ancestors came to Minnesota to get away from all the European wars. Well, at least that was their idea. But with almighty powerful countries, Great Britain, France, and Spain, they were looking to get a piece of the newly discovered North America. And yes, they fought tooth and nail to claim the new continent that was rich with resources. Now just think about it. Head south to Africa with your textiles, rum, gunpowder, and manufacturer's good. Pick up slaves and catch the wind from Europe to the Caribbean. Next, grab their coffee, sugar, and molasses, maybe stop by Starbucks, before stopping off to the colonies to get tobacco and hemp, um, hemp for rope, not that other type of weed, before catching another wind, heading northeast back to England or Europe for the year-long trip. What a deal. Not just one trading triangle, but two when you bring the poor African slaves into the equation. And let's not forget about the plight of the Native Americans who were not all that happy to see the white man claiming their waterways and hunting grounds to say nothing about the plagues that killed off their messes. So are we having fun yet? No? Well, to further complicate matters, finally, in the mid-1800s, the British Redcoats, who were aided by hundreds of thousands of American colonists, drove out the French and the Spanish as they inquired their territory. 
So who do you think England wanted to pay for these costly wars, I ask you? Right. The colonists figuring, hey, you should be paying taxes for your defense, right? Well, the loyalists were fine with the idea, but for other colonists, the idea of taxation without representation didn't sit too well for those who called themselves the patriots. Oh no. So in a way, with the loyalists fighting with the British and against their fellow countrymen, well, this is getting really complicated, isn't it? And with Great Britain having an abundance of resources to wage war, they were more than willing to engage the native Indians and even professional German Hussian soldiers to fight off against the revolutionary patriots. Okay, so in 1775, all of this finally boiled over starting the Revolutionary War with the patriots fighting for freedom against Great Britain and in a way, I guess, those loyalists of their countrymen. Prior to the Bennington Battle, Patriot leader General George Washington called Colonel John Stark and his New Hampshire men to defend key locations in New Jersey. The good news and good fortune started off quite well for the Patriots. So, after holding off the British, who had their eyes on the rebel capital in Philadelphia, next Washington asked Stark to return home to New Hampshire and recruit more fresh countrymen. By the way, aside from their cannons and years of training, the trained British Redcoats could load and fire their muskets mm, two to maybe up to five times in a minute. So a professional soldier in this time period has to be able to shoot and reload this musket three times in the space of one minute. Oh, three? Yes. So <laughs> That's blazing. Of 20 seconds. While the Patriots, they were fiddling with their flintlock rifles, they could scarcely fire around every two to three minutes. Hmm. No wonder later in the war the battle cry was, wait till you see the whites of their eyes. So with organized rebellion in the colony, soon enough General John Burgoyne and 6,000 of the conquering British Redcoats who had finished off the French in Canada now headed south invading Vermont to seize Albany, New York and sever rebel supplies between North and Southern colonies. Meanwhile, whew, Colonel Stark countered, leading his patriots to southern Vermont where the Battle of Bennington would take place. Okay, on August 16, 1777, Colonel John Stark, along with three other commanding officers from New Hampshire, Vermont, and Massachusetts, initially encountered 6,000 redcoats to make a bold preemptive attack during a rainstorm. Later, when British reinforcements arrived to recover 1,000 of their captured and wounded men, well, more good fortune was with Colonel Stark and the Patriots when, in the nick of time, they were aided by Colonel Warner and his troops from Vermont. And, the surprising dismay of the British, the Patriots won a decisive victory after making a preemptive attack over the British at Bennington, or nearby Bennington, about six miles away, right on the border of New York. For sure, John Stark knew how to motivate his men. When rookies would first hear or see cannon fire, Stark would joke, saying, the Redcoats were just offering a welcome celebration. And in reference to his wife, Molly, Stark's battle cry was, we'll beat them before night, or Molly Stark will be a widow. Wow. As a result of the heroism of his men against the aggregate superior British force, Stark's win boosted the Patriots' morale and slowed down the invading British Redcoats, a truly significant turning point for the American Revolution. On the other side, British General John Burgoyne's loss of a thousand of his 6,000 strong, well-trained, well-equipped professional military is unto itself an interesting story. Leading his troops on the charge into Canada, he was supported by fellow British General Howe's forces. Now Burgoyne figured with Howe's men, as well as General Clinton's troops, it would be easy pickings for him and his 7,000 troops to seize Albany, New York, and cut off the supply lines from the southern states. Besides, up to that point, morale was high for Burgoyne's men. But as they moved south into Vermont, the British Army began lacking food and supplies. So, military intelligence, if you want to call it that and forget the oxymoron, believed that the Patriots would not be a threat and headed for Bennington's large stash of corn, wheat, horses, and cattle. 
Oh, I suppose munitions too. And with the change in weather, Burgoyne's men were hampered by a heavy fall storm, halting their advance five miles northwest of Bennington near Wollumsack Heights at the border between New York and Vermont. However, Generals Clinton and Howe were autonomously seeking their own conquest, seizing the then continental capital at Philadelphia on September 26, 1777. Based on other wars, the British assumed essentially that the war was over when the enemy's capital was conquered. Um, no, hold on a second. Not so far for the Patriots, rebels, whose military vowed to fight on. Worse, as often happens with autonomous leaders seeking personal fame and glory during the turmoils and fog of war, generals were none too keen to help one another during conquest, figuring they would not enjoy fame, fortune, or promotions. So it turned out that Burgoyne and a sizable army did not have logistical support during their charge of Bennington and then heading on towards Albany. Okay, over the following weeks, Burgoyne and his remaining men moved east towards Saratoga, New York, while convening his war council. Yet he ignored their recommendation to temporarily retreat, believing it would put them in disgrace. During this time, thousands of emboldened Patriot Minutemen piled into the epicenter, leaving the Redcoats surrounded and outnumbered three to one and lacking their captured artillery. Worse, many of their top leaders and strack German soldiers were captured or lost at Bennington. Hmm. Further, the Indian scouts had their fill of the white man's war and hadn't signed up to be soldiers, which was not the way they engaged their enemies anyway. So, Burgoyne decided to surrender, that that would be the better option rather than trying to retreat all the way back to Quebec and get picked off in process. So despite gaining some reinforcements from loyalists, fighting against the Patriot countrymen, Burgoyne surrendered his 8,000 troops and all of their weapons on October 17, 1777. Now this was a second major upset after Bennington. These events were a major turning point that encouraged France to enter an alliance with the American Patriots, which was a huge benefit with their ships to disrupt the supplies from England. And while at the time, General Burgoyne was solely viewed as the fall guy for the stunning loss that led to the end of that part of the war, but behind the scenes, historians eventually realized that British Secretary of State for the Colonies, Lord Germain, erred by neglecting to order General Howe to support Burgoyne's invasion. Instead, he allowed the ambitious Howe to launch his own attack on Philadelphia and claim the Patriots' capital, which sounded like a good idea at the time, but they underestimated the will of the Patriots' resolve for freedom to protect their homeland. Now, ironically, along the same line, 99 years later, apparently General Custer must have missed this critical lesson during his training at West Point. And so a century later, at Little Bighorn, Custer also sought fame and glory by going into battle without waiting for supporting force from General Terry and superior firepower, including a battery of Gatling machine guns. Um, for more, I'd recommend that you go over to our California travel videos on Little Bighorn for Custer's Last Stand for the full story. I'm going to tell you guys why I share this history. I share it with you because it belongs to you. If you're an immigrant, if you're American, you know, if you're Montanan, if you're native or non-native, if you served in our armed forces or not, doesn't matter. This history is yours. Take it with you. Share it proudly because today this is our combined shared history together. This is now what unifies us today. Well, Grace, back to the main story. In fact, speaking about stories, you know, when we go to different places, it's so wonderful to have rich stories where we can share. And a lot of it, you think you're going to see the site, the location, and you find out that there is a lot behind it. I wish we had more time. We could say so much more about John Stark, about um, Burgoyne, and about uh, so much of the other history. General Washington, we're going to be talking about that some more later. But Grace, let's go ahead and see what you've got. Wow, there are just so many great lessons that we can learn from history. Thanks so much for that interesting backstory and how you tied it in to Custard's Last Stand. It's so easy to understand why the people of New Hampshire admired John Stark so much that they quoted his words in their state's motto, live free or die. 
we left Vermont, we forgot the sticker. So we're going to do that now before we take our bike ride. So let's okay, go ahead and let's put that on. Christen the RV with a yet another sticker. Does that kind of complete our northeastern sector? It does. Hey, hey. Have you been to California? Seen the sights and people there? Walked the streets of sleepy sea towns, tasted salty ocean air.